again, a warm place to meet for getting us here safely. We pray for safe return home and for all those who are out in the cold. And now, Lord, prepare our hearts for your word and your words. Not, not my words, not anybody else's words, but your words. It's your words that mold us and shape us and change us. So help us to hear what you have to say. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I don't know if it's the, the cold or, or what. I just feel nervous today. I just had a couple of people say that. It just feels kind of nervous today. Um, we've been working through several things. I mean, we started before Christmas, and then we got into Christmas things with John chapter 3. Uh, but we were in Ephesians before and after that. So Ephesians chapter 2 is where we're going to be here in just a moment. Uh, after the Gospels, Gospel means good news. So about three-quarters of the way through your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then you get into the small letters or groups of letters, which is an epistle. Uh, get into those. Um, so if you're Acts, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, you get into this group of uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So we'll be in Philippians or Ephesians chapter two here in just a moment. And and that section, the latter part of Ephesians chapter one, it talks about the eyes of our heart. And I mentioned that. I know I've mentioned it before, but I mentioned that again because it's important. So this eyes of our heart and how. How can we see what God wants us to see? How can we recognize things like spiritual warfare? How can we recognize these things that mold us and shape us and change us as the prayer goes? How, how can we get there? Um, there's a psalm, so may the, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. Well, we, we have to somehow get in the right frequency. We have to get in the right step or that's not going to happen. So sometimes, I mean, sometimes it's just not possible to meet together. We have us online, so we're going live, and that's wonderful. Um, wonderful technology, so the people that can't get out, it's very inconvenient to get out. So it's sometimes not safe to get out. And that idea, we can connect, but how do we connect ourselves to God? Technologically, we can be connected one to another, but our connection with God's different than that. Open the eyes of my heart. Help me to see what you want me to see. Help me to hear what you want me to hear. Help me to understand what you want me to understand. And that's sort of where we've been going. We've talked about our resistance. We have this natural resistance to God, to sin, to pride. We have this natural resistance in us. We have these other things that sort of fight against the things of God, and we, whether we realize it or not. Uh, last week, we talked about how grace and forgiveness are permanent, because that, that's a common question. I mean, we wouldn't Maybe it's not your common question, but many people have the question, I thought I was right with God. I go to church, I've been to church, I've been by the church, whatever the analogy is, and I thought I was good with God, but now I'm not sure that I am. And sometimes that conviction is a good thing because it moves us into God's presence. It gets us right with Him for sure, where it's a I shall. It was one of the first things a Christian mentor told me, this, you know, you get your relationship right with God, and it's you shall. You shall go to heaven. You are right with God. You shall be forgiven. That's what the Bible says. You get those things right, and it's never going to be taken from you. But the devil gets in there, and our pride gets in there, and our sin gets in there, and gets us to thinking that maybe, just maybe, God's tired of hearing our prayers. Maybe, just maybe, I'm not as forgiven as I thought. Maybe, just maybe, I thought I was going to heaven, but now I'm not so sure. That confirmation, if you are a genuine believer in Christ, if you have accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, if you follow Him and choose to follow Him all the days of your life, you shall be saved. The words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, it's Romans 10, 8, and 9. That idea that if you are saved, you are always saved. The quote from C.H. Spurgeon last week, if you haven't seen it, watch it online, it is very, very powerful. It is that nothing can keep you out. There is not one believer in hell. Nothing's going to keep you out. Nothing's going to separate you ever. You're going to go to heaven and like it, but you're, gonna, you're not going to be restricted from that ever. So that was last week's. And this idea, this week we're going to look at the three points on your, on your bulletin are power, perspective, and pos perspective and position. So if you, there's a one-page insert in your Bible, and there's three points that we're going to walk through very fairly quickly, is power, perspective, and position that, that God offers to us. So, oops, get my eyes on. Please stand as you are able to, out of reverence for God's Word. This is uh, 
from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. Uh, all New Testament from Matthew to the end of the Bible are all written to Christians. So he's writing to Christians in the church just like you. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 9. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that the coming ages, in the coming ages, we, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. Please be seated. Almost went on. There's one more verse. We're going to get to that in a week or two. C.H. Spurgeon was close to the closing of last week's message, and he has a, a short, couple short little paragraphs, short little sentences here, not paragraphs. C.H. Spurgeon says, Christian, you are free at this moment from the penalty of sin. Not only are you forgiven, but you never shall be punished on account of your sins, however great and enormous they have, may have been. That's the devil's thing. He gets this. Well, your sin's a little bit too big. Isaiah 53, 6, not on the screen, but the next one is, all of us, all of us, like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to his own way, but the Lord has caused the wickedness of us all, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing to fall on him instead of us. 1 John 1, 9, this was written potentially 60 years after Christ went back up to heaven. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he will forgive our sins because we can trust God to do what is right. He will cleanse us from all the wrongs that we have done. C.H. Spurgeon connecting these. If, I'm a, if a true believer, if I am a true believer, I stand here freed from every sin. There's not a crime against me in the book of God. It is blotted out forever. It is canceled. Not only can I never be punished, but I have nothing to be punished for. Christ has atoned for or covered my sins, and I have received his righteousness. Romans 3, Paul's letter to the church in Rome, Romans 3, 25, verse 25. God sent him or Christ to die in our place to take away our sins. We receive forgiveness through faith in the blood of Jesus' death. But until we accept spiritual life, part of it's on us. Until we accept this spiritual life that God offers to us, we remain separated from God. And that the fill in the blank, there's one fill in the blank in each part here, so we'll fill in the blank. When we were dead, when we were spiritually dead, you know, came to give us spiritual life, born again. When we were dead, we were unable to respond to the things of God. When we were dead, we were unable to respond to the things of God. It wasn't that we couldn't hear them, it's that we couldn't respond to them. And there's this idea we're physically alive, but we're spiritually dead. And then Jesus comes along and in his teachings, he says, nobody, nobody can come to the God the Father unless the Father, nobody can come to God, nobody can come to me unless God the Father draws them in. It's God's pursuit of us. We get it all wrong. We think it's our pursuit of God. It's not. It's God's pursuit of us. He's the one who awakens this desire. He's the one that pushes us toward. He's the one that moves us away from our sin nature and our pride and the forces of this world. He's the one that draws us in because he loves us. That's why he does that. Second Peter, so same letter. Uh, I think it's the same letter. Uh, it's going to be for Easter. Second Peter 1, 3 and 4. Jesus has the power of God by which he has given us everything we need to live and serve God. We have these things because we know him. 
Jesus called us by His glory and goodness. Through these, He gave us the very great and precious promises. With these gifts, you can share in God's nature. The world and the world will not ruin you with its evil desires. God has breathed life into every believer. Breathe life. This wasn't Ricky's baptism. This wasn't something that just she was born with. And before she went to kindergarten, I just cannot wait to join a Baptist church. I cannot wait to go to church. I cannot wait to get baptized. No, it's God breathing life into us. It's it's a change. Uh, Cecil, no, he's known me for longer than anybody here has. <laughs> so it's it's this idea. There's a change in you. There's a, there's a change as you walk with Christ and you get called by Him and you start adopting and adapting other things into your life. There's a change that happens. The very first book of the Bible, Genesis, second chapter, it says that God made a mound of dirt. He created a man and He breathed into Adam's nostrils. How intimate is that? He breathed into his nostrils. He breathed life into Adam. And he breathes life into every believer. That's what God does. It's intimate. It is personal. He breathes life into Adam just like he did to every believer. When Jesus died, the power that rose Jesus from the dead is the same power that becomes available to the believer. When's the last time you thought about that? That that same power that raised Jesus back up to life just like symbolizes with baptism. The same power that rose him to life is the same power that God grants every single believer. It says, when you die, you're going to be with me. Isn't that something? We probably didn't think about that when we were outside freezing our fingers off. Is that, wow, I, I, didn't, I didn't think, I don't know why I didn't think about it, but I didn't think about it. Romans 8, if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. This spiritual life changes some things. And we got a couple points on this. It changes things. It makes us aware of things that we weren't necessarily aware of before we we start to see things differently we start to think about things differently we start to interpret things differently we start to see others differently we start to see the world around us differently like from a not a here and now instant gratification but more from an eternal perspective we start to see things different than we did before second corinthians 5 17 we've had this a couple times but it's very important 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ that is grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as Savior, he or she is a new creature, reborn and renewed of the Holy Spirit. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition have passed away. Behold, new things have come because spiritual awakening brings new life. We all once, that's what Paul says, we all once walked according to the ways of this world. We were all once walking in the ways of this world. We were in step with the world around us. The spiritual life gives us an awareness. And one of the things, we're going to talk about other things. One of the things is this dimension that we couldn't see before. And there's a couple instances of this. I just, just really quickly. In 2 Kings 6, the prophet Elisha, Elisha, Elijah came before him, but Elisha, they're in this town. The king is after him. They surrounded the town. The king, Elisha's servant gets up, wakes up the prophet, says, wake up, quick, quick, quick. What are we going to do? We're surrounded. The enemy has surrounded us. And Elisha prays, Lord, open my servant's eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw that the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. It's not that it wasn't there, it's that he couldn't see it. When Jesus was walking, he takes Peter, James, and John, they go up on this mountain, they call it Mount of Transfiguration, because Jesus was transfigured there. As Jesus was there, suddenly Moses and Elijah appear there. Now, Moses and Elijah died way before that. Well, Elijah was, or Elisha was taken up to heaven. Moses, it says God buried him on the mountain. But that was hundreds and hundreds of years before. And here they show up and they recognize them on this mountain. Interesting. 
Matthew 17, 1 through 3, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and the brother of James on up a high mountain by themselves. While they watched, Jesus' appearance was changed. His face became bright like the sun and his clothes became white as light. Then Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with Jesus. They saw something they were not able to see before. And this idea, this access to power was the first point. The second point is perspective because it gives us a different perspective on life. I don't know what your faith walk is. Some of you, I know some of it about. But many of you, most of you, I do not. Coming to Christ, walking with God, spending time with His Word changes our perspective on many things. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms. We talked about that last week. Paul's talking to the church. They hadn't died yet. We haven't died yet. But it, we're seated with him in the heavenly realm somehow. I don't quite get that. But we are. This new spiritual life changes our perspective. We get a new mind and a new heart and a new outlook. And the devil sometimes gets in there too and he tries to separate you. You thought you were different, but you're not. Well, it's God living in us. We can still get depressed. We can still battle addiction. We can still battle frustration and sin and lust and all the rest. We can still battle that, but we don't belong to it anymore. That's the difference. We battle it, but we don't belong to it anymore. And when we get to heaven, there's going to be all sorts of changes. You know, the no more death, sighing, sorrow, sadness, crying, pain, part of death, part of heaven. This idea because there's no sin there. That's true. When Jesus walked the earth, there was a, a physical element to it, too, where Jesus could do things that we can't do. We can't, we can't do the things that he did when he came back. Uh, just a real snippet very quickly. Luke 24, uh, 15, 16, and 30, 31. While they, the apostles, were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and began walking, or the two on the way to Emmaus. Jesus came near and began walking with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. I don't know how that happened. When Jesus was at the table with them, he took some bread, gave thanks, divided it, and gave it to them. And then they were allowed to recognize Jesus. And then Jesus disappeared. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody that can do that. I don't know anybody that comes over for supper and I go to hand them a glass of water and they disappear. I, I, I'd be a little weirded out by that. So that isn't how it works. In John 20, in John 20, verses 19 and 20, and 25 to 27, both of those account, Jesus was meeting with the disciples. I, I'm back. I'm alive. You, you can do this. And he appears. They were in the house. They were in the room. The doors were locked. When it was evening on the first day of the week, Jesus' followers were together. The doors were locked because they were afraid of the elders. Crucified Jesus, might crucify them. Then Jesus came and stood right in the middle of them and said, peace be with you. Well, I don't know if I would have peace right then. Poof. Peace be with you. Well, where'd you come from? I'm here. After they said this, they show, he showed him his hands and his feet. His followers were thrilled when they saw the Lord. Verse 25 in chapter 20, Thomas says, I will not believe, talking to the disciples, I will not believe until I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were in his side. A week later, the followers were in the house again. And Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. But Jesus came and stood right in the middle of them, and he said, peace be with you. Hmm. Different. That's different. Jesus was made alive, and we're made alive because of Jesus. Jesus was raised, and we are going to be raised just like he was. Jesus was seated with God, and we're going to be with God. All those things are true. I know we don't live it like that. Our news doesn't talk like that. Our world doesn't talk like that, but that's exactly the way it's going to work. Colossians 1, or Colossians 3, verses 1 through 3. If you have been raised with Christ to a new life and sharing in his resurrection from the dead, keep seeking the things that are above. Keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind. Remember I talked about the mind in spiritual warfare? Set your mind and keep focused habitually on the things above, the heavenly things, not on things that are on earth, which only have temporary value, for you died to this world and your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. Please take that home with you. That's Colossians 3, 1 through 3, and it's on the back. The fill in the blank. 
Everything about our spiritual life is based on what Jesus did for us. Everything about our spiritual life is based on what Jesus did for us, not on what we can do. Philippians 1.6, God began doing a good work in you, and I am sure that he will continue it until it is finished when Christ Jesus comes again. Romans 12, I urge you, brothers and sisters, do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in His plan and purpose for you. God raised all believers and gives us access to the spiritual dimension because He loves you. Because God loves you. That's why that happens like that. God, we love because God loved us first. That's 1 John four nineteen. We had a typo on that earlier this week. We love, we get love all mixed up, but we love because God loved us first. It's inverted from what we normally see. So we get this power that God gives us. We get this perspective that God gives us. And the last point is position. We're placed into a position that God gives us. And this, this is going to tie in another scripture, but I think I can link it all together. In the Gospel of Matthew, this event, this, this is recording where Jesus is introduced to this man. Some call him a real young man. Some call him a rich man. But this guy comes to Jesus and says, what do I need to do to get this life you're talking about? How can I, what do I need to give? What do I need to do? What do I need to earn? What do I need to practice? How can I get this life that you talked about in the baptistry or in spiritual warfare or whatever it was? How can I get, how, excuse me, how can I get it? Matthew 19, it's 16 through 26. A man came to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to have life forever? Jesus answered, you must not murder anybody, you must not be guilty of adultery, you must not steal, you must not tell lies about your neighbor, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. The young man said, I have obeyed all these things. What else do I need to do? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, then go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. If you do this, you will have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. But when the young man heard this, he left sorrowfully because he was rich. Then Jesus said to his followers, I tell you the truth, it'll be, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Yes, I tell you that it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When Jesus' followers heard this, they were very surprised and asked, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for people this is impossible, but for God all things are possible. Hmm. Okay. So what in the world does that have to do with what we're talking about? Well, first of all, this man knew that the eternal life that Jesus talked about was something that he did not have. That's a connection. The spiritual warfare you're talking about, I don't understand it. The baptism part, that just seems weird to me. The church part, why in the world? We're at church, the wind chills like 20 and below zero. What in the world are these people doing out there? That idea, it seems odd. It seems strange. He knew there was something that, he, that Jesus had or Jesus taught about that he did not have. So he wanted to, Jesus to tell him, tell me, teach me, show me. What do I need to do to earn what you're talking about? Just tell me. I've, I've done these things. I've done some of these things. What else do I need to do to earn it? And many today approach God and approach church and approach the rituals and approach the Bible and approach godly things with that same mental attitude. What do I need to do? Do I need to go to church? Do I need to join a church? Do I need to be a deacon? Do I need to get baptized? Do I need to teach Sunday school? What do I need to do? Do I need to preach a sermon? Do I need to go to seminary? What do I need to do to, so that God will accept me? I, my life's kind of a mess. So what do I need to do to get that life that Jesus talks about? Is it if, if I could figure out how to live perfectly or I, I become sort of a monk in a way? I, I become isolated from everything and everyone. If I read through the Ten Commandments, don't commit adultery, honor your father and mother, don't murder, keep God above everything else, don't have idols. If I can do those Ten Commandments perfectly, is, is then 
then will I, will I do it? Because the laws of the Pharisees were based on that. So if I can keep the Ten Commandments, is that, is that what I need? Will I be granted into fellowship with a holy God, a separate God, if I can just do enough? Adrian Rogers this week, late Baptist preacher Adrian Rogers, um, and all this talk, because there's the whole doomsday clock coming on, and he said in, in the nuclear age, most of the world was amazed by the power of a nuclear weapon. Hiroshima decimates a town. They have these tests under the sea. You've probably seen the sea blowing up. And that was a nine megaton, I think. And they have like 50 and bigger megaton bombs now. And we talk about the incredible power of a nuclear weapon, of how immense that is. And Adrian Rogers says, if it was possible for you to have a nuclear bomb tap attached to you and they detonate it as powerful as that bomb is to, to flatten hundreds and hundreds of miles and kill millions of people if that bomb was strapped to you and ignited and blew up it could not rid you of your sin <laughs> it would vaporize you physically but it couldn't take the sin away from you oh <sighs> And I don't know about you, but that like switched something in my head and went, whoa, I agree with what you're saying. I can't get my head around it, but I agree with what you're saying. The fill in the blank. If it were possible for anyone to be restored back into fellowship with God without the sacrifice of his son, there was no reason for Jesus to die. If anyone, if anyone could be restored back into fellowship with God without the sacrifice of his son, there was no reason for Jesus to die. Doesn't that sound odd? I mean, we get it. We come to church. We just got done with Christmas. Easter's coming at us a thousand mile an hour. That was the only way. Even Jesus asked that, Lord, if there's, Father, if there's another way, let's go the other way. If you can take this cup of suffering from me, please take this cup of suffering from me. But there wasn't another way. That was the only way. I'm the only way back to God, he says in Acts 4. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he says in John 14. The entire system of sacrifices and rules and laws and rituals of the Old Testament all prove that we cannot keep God's law perfectly. They tried for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. They tried. They tried to keep the sacrifices. They tried to do the right blood. They tried to keep the priest going right. They tried to have all of these offerings of forgiveness. And still the priest had to wear a rope around him when he went in once a year. Because if he did something wrong, he was going to fall dead. Nobody else could go in after him. So they had to drag him out if that was ever going to happen. We could not keep it perfectly. No one can keep God's law perfectly. All of the rules, all of the sacrifice, all of the rituals, all the stuff, all prove that we can't do it on our own. Isaiah 64, 6. Just listen for the alls and the no ones and the wiles. All of us are dirty with sin. All the right things we have done are like filthy pieces of cloth. There's kids in here, so I can't tell you what, it, what that means. But filthy pieces of cloth. All of us are like dead leaves, and our sins, like the wind, have carried us away. Romans 3, 10 and 12. As the scriptures say, there is no one who always does what is right, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who looks for God for, to God for help. All have turned away. Together, everyone has become useless. And there is no one who does anything good, not even one. That's from the Old Testament also, Psalm 14. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and continually for us fall short of the glory of God. Romans 5.8, God shows his great love for us in this way. Christ died for, died for us while we were still sinners. That's why the guy asked the question, what can I do? What can I do to be right with you? I've kept these laws as best as I could. What else can I do to earn this eternal life? And because of his sin nature and because of our sin nature, the only way back into righteousness, the only way back into right standing with God is through his son. That's the only way back in. Because we cannot keep God's laws. We can't do it. We cannot live a sinless life. I know lots of people have tried to live a sinless life. It doesn't work. You can't do it. You can try. It's futile. 
But you can't. We can't do it. Nobody can do it. It is not possible for anyone to give enough, know enough, sacrifice enough, or try hard enough to please a holy God. We're not here to try and please God. We're here to thank God for giving us a way back to Him. That's what church is. Galatians 2, 1 to 3, 5. If righteousness could be attained through the law, Christ died for nothing. If righteousness, when it says by the law, that means by its system of rules and sacrifices and rituals. That's what the law means in the Old Testament. Or by the New Testament. You weren't saved by the law. Then in this letter to the Galatians, Paul goes on and says, you foolish Galatians. He's talking to the church. You foolish Galatians. Who's tricked you? Who's bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by obeying by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? What did you get new life by? Was it, did you get new life by getting in the baptistry? Did you get new life by being confirmed? Did you get new life by going through catechism? Did you get new life by joining a church? Did you get new life when you finally made it through the sixth year of being a deacon? Did you get new life by teaching enough, knowing enough, learning enough? No. That's none of that thing give you none of that gave you life. Jesus is what gives you life. And that's all that gives you life. In the Old Testament there was a commander. God Elijah cured him of his leprosy. Elisha cured him of his le- leprosy. He goes back, he tries to pay him. Take this stuff. Take take this stuff. Naaman took and left his with him about 750 pounds of silver as well as 150 pounds of gold. Not ounces. Pounds of gold. Naaman and all of his group returned to Elisha and there before Elisha and said, Look, I know that there is no God in all of earth except Israel. Please accept this gift from me. The gift of eternal life can't be purchased. In the book of Acts, it's Acts 8. Simon the sorcerer saw that the Spirit was given to people when the apostles laid their hands on him. So he offered the apostles money, saying, oh, Give me also this power so that anyone whom I lay my hands will receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter said to him, you and your money should both be destroyed because you thought you could buy God's gift with money. We do the same thing. We do the same thing as we're going through this stuff. It's not about our, what we can earn or buy. It's not luck or chance or fate or any of the other rituals that we do. It's not how we do communion and it's not what church we join. It's not what translation of the Bible we read. It's none of that. It's where is our heart with Christ? The thief on the cross, Easter time's coming up. One thief dies, he's yelling at him. One thief dies, says, Lord, accept me into your kingdom. That thief didn't have any chance to do anything. He wasn't baptized. He didn't memorize anything. He didn't go anywhere. Alistair Begg has a wonderful sermon. The thief on the cross that Jesus talked to He gets to heaven and, what are you doing here? Were you baptized? Did you go to church? Were you a deacon? Did you go to seminary? Did you preach? Did you teach? Well, I don't know. All I know is the guy on the middle cross said I could come. Us too. All I know is the guy on the middle cross said I could be here. Luke 23, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. And one more thing. Just like where we started, God's promise of salvation to you can never be taken back. Can never be taken back. So when the devil starts telling you you're not saved because of something you did in your past, God's offer of salvation can never be taken back. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him may not be lost but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to judge the world guilty but to save the world through him. It can't be taken back. If you missed any of the points, first one was power. When we were dead, we were unable to respond to the things of God. Perspective, everything about spiritual life is based on what Jesus did for us. And position, if it were possible for anybody to be, anyone to be restored and back into fellowship with God without the sacrifice of his son, there was no reason for Jesus to die. Please, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you. There was so much in there. Help us to remember it. 
Help us to live it. Help us to know it. And for that man, that woman, that boy, that girl, if there's any question, if there's any doubt of our relationship with you, help us to get that right, right this moment, whether they're sitting in this sanctuary, this set-apart room, or whether they're watching from home, wherever they are, wherever they are, that their prayer would be, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't explain why I did what I did. I just know that the way I was living or the way that I am living is not what you want. Your word and your word somehow said something different to me than I've heard before. I can't explain it. But I know that I'm sorry. I'm sorry for how I lived and the things I've done and the things I've said. I'm sorry for the things that I've lived as. And I want you to live in me, to move into my heart, to move into my life, to be my Lord, the authority of my life, all of my life, not just Sunday mornings, not just warm, not just cold, all of my life, my personal life, my home life, my intimate life, my work life, my daily life, my thought life. Move in. You be my Lord, and I trust that you will be my Savior to save me from my sins, to save me from myself, to save me from my pride, to save me from the world around me, that you will save me from my sin and somehow, some way, make me right with this holy, separate God in heaven. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.